Welcome to this episode of Flourishing Leadership. I'm your host, Guy Rogers, and our mission here is to help you unleash the full potential of your leadership calling. You can find out more about Flourishing Leadership at flourishing-leadership.com. My guest today is R. York Moore. Moore serves as the president, CEO, and national evangelist for the Coalition for Christian Outreach. Moore is a speaker, revivalist, and abolitionist. He holds a BA in philosophy from the University of Michigan and an MA in global leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary. He's the co-founder of the Every Campus Movement, a coalition of over 120 organizations seeking God for revival on American college campuses. York is the author of several books, including Do Something Beautiful and Seen, Known, Loved, co-authored with Dr. Gary Chapman. Moore lives on his farm in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with his wife of 27 years, three children, and enjoys the hard work of tending to the land and animals. So, York, thank you so much for joining our podcast today. Uh, it's my pleasure. Good to see your face again. So, you know, there's the old saying, let's begin at the beginning. So I want to start with, as you and I were talking off air, you had just started work with the Christian, the Coalition for Christian Outreach about, you know, 18, 19 months ago, something like that. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. You know, what drew you to this position? What is it about? What's the mission? You know, just fill our listeners in. Yeah. Well, I became a Christian uh, while I was in college. So I went to college in 1987 as an atheist, and I never left. So I've been on campus, <laughs> college campuses now ever since. And and I just have a passion for the college campus. I have a passion for college students. I believe that this generation is a revival generation. We're going to see a move of God in this generation like we have never seen before. When I left my businesses and came on staff full-time with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and uh, was uh, their national evangelist for most of my 27 years of employment with them. And then uh, about 18 months ago, moved over to the Coalition for Christian Outreach to take the president's role. And I did that for a couple of reasons. I was looking for something new and exciting. I was looking for something in the collegiate space. But I was also looking for an organization that partnered more deeply with churches. So there are lots and lots of great parachurch organizations, and I love them all. I'm friends with leaders from Chi Alpha and Crew and InterVarsity and Young Life and all of the others. And every campus, it's like a big family. But the Coalition for Christian Outreach is unique in that we actually partner deeply with the local church to bring the gospel to the college campus through the congregation. Okay. So we hire missionaries, we put them on staff with churches, discipleship happens in the context of a multi-generational church context. We have a metric in the CCO, Coalition for Christian Outreach, you can just refer to us as the CCO. We have a metric that we measure student involvement in the life of the church beyond Sunday. So we're very, very passionate about the local church. And so when I came over to the CCO, I was mostly excited because I've been a church guy really ever since I became born again. I believe that the church is the hope of the world. It's Christ's body. And that, uh, you know, what better mission field to mobilize the local church in than on the college campus? And mm -hmm. here's the great news, Guy. There are countless churches who have a burden and a passion and a calling to serve college students. And we're here to partner with them to reach students for Christ. Super, super. So before we go on, what's the website? Somebody wants to find out more. Yeah, ccojubilee.org, ccojubilee.org. Dot org, and we'll talk a little bit about Jubilee. It's not just our conference, it's our vision. We have this incredible Jubilee vision. So CCO Jubilee is the website. Okay. So we'll come back to that in a, in a few moments. I was intrigued by something you said. And you said that this generation, college age generation, is a revival generation. You believe that a great revival is coming through this generation. That really kind of runs counter to where you see most I think most Christians looking at the Gen Z generation uh, in terms of when you look at polling data, how secular, you know, those things. So I'm curious as to what has informed that view in you about that generation. 
Yeah. Well, my previous career before going into ministry was uh, statistical ana analysis. And so I'm a big stats guy. I've been watching the birth cohort data that we commonly refer to as Gen Z. I don't tend to think of millennials and Gen Z. I tend to think of birth cohorts. And I've been studying the birth cohort data from a number of different data points over the last 10 years or so. And now we have Gen Z coming to our college campuses, and they couldn't be different from more different than the previous generations. You know, one of the things that we know about Gen Z is that they're the largest generation in American history. We also know that they're the most unchurched generation in American history. And that might sound like bad news, but the reality is there is a blank slate. There is an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Many of them who have, have never held a Bible, they've never been to church. Mm -hmm. And unlike the secularization that has happened in other places, all throughout Europe and other places, the secularization that's actually happened in the United States isn't anti-faith. There is maybe a distrust in institutionalized religion. There maybe is a distrust in some of the culture trappings of evangelicalism. But when you actually talk about the Bible, when you actually talk about Jesus with Gen Z, there is a profound openness. Over 54% of them actually have a very favorable predisposition towards faith. So we shouldn't think of the fact that Gen Z as an unchurched, biblically illiterate generation is a lost generation. In fact, I think we're going to see a move of God in that generation like we have never seen before. Wow. Wow. You know, it's interesting you talk about that generation and you mentioned, you know, how you came to Christ in college. I grew up in a totally unchurched home totally secular. I didn't know anything about Christianity or the Bible. So when I got saved at a Young Life camp at age 18, right after I graduated from high school, there was a blank slate there. I, I like to joke about how I didn't know the difference between a Buddhist and a Baptist at that point, which wasn't too far off. And so it allowed the opportunity for the man I refer to as my spiritual father, who five years later, in 1978, discipled me for four years. He was the president of a small Bible school and literally was able to just speak into my life, lead me to books, have to Socratic discussions, and I didn't have any predispositions in terms of different denominations and so on. It was all about, okay, what do the scriptures teach? That's what we dig in on. So I can see that with respect to that generation of college students today. That there is, while there is a, an obstacle of having no faith, there's also great opportunity, as you're referring to. Yeah, that's right. Well, and your story really proves a point that's true in every single generation, that if you come to Jesus and you have the, the luxury, and unfortunately it is a luxury, of being personally discipled, the likelihood that you're going to remain in the faith, the likelihood that you're going to flourish in the faith, the likelihood that you're going to one day take on the mantle of leadership and influence is astronomically higher because you've had that discipleship experience. When I became a Christian, I didn't know what discipleship was. And I found myself being discipled by an InterVarsity staffer, and it changed my life. And then I had the privilege of being discipled by two other men along the way early in my faith. I thought that was normal. But the reality is the vast majority of Christians have never experienced a one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationship with somebody who's further along in their journey. So in the CCO, we're encountering college students on the college campus. We're discipling women and men with this vision of joining God, of making all things new, sending them into society, into their careers as a part of redeeming the world around us. That discipleship vision, I think, is contagious. When you give a young person a sense of purpose and direction and vision, that's rooted in the scriptures, that's rooted in the bigger story than what they're coming out of, it is just infectious. And we have seen now, CCO has been around since 1971, for over 50 years, we've launched generations into the workplace, primarily. We are kind of a faith and work-oriented organization. Mm -hmm. So as we disciple students, we're sending them into industry, into their careers, with this great vision of God's work of redeeming all things. Wow. You know, it's amazing. Uh, the page you're talking about here with respect to discipleship is so much where I am. The promise of discipleship that I experienced and the perplexity when I came out of that experience, assuming, well, this must be normative in Christianity because, you know, Jesus did it. That's how the model. And yet I discovered what you are referring to, that the vast majority of Christians have not experienced this type of walking in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone who's walked the path before 
that person. And it is it's just bewildered me that this is not the case. Speak to that, if you will, for a moment. What can we do to change this so we can get to a place where discipleship becomes central to what we are doing through the body of Christ, as Jesus instructed us to do? Well, Guy, I think the question we have to ask first is, why is discipleship a foreign idea? Why do we resist it? Why is it a difficulty when really Jesus calls us to himself to be disciples? Now, as an evangelist, I love the conversion moment. I love calling women and men to Christ, and I've done so uh, on TikTok. I've done so in large audiences, small audiences, face-to-face, in person. I love that, right? But after the conversion moment, there is a lifetime of discipleship. You know, I think one of the one of the great lies of the evangelical faith in North America is the subtlety of what we call dualism. This yes. idea that we pray a prayer and one day we'll just magically fly off to another planet while this one burns. It couldn't be further from the biblical story. And so without getting too philosophic or theological, you know, in the CCO, we believe in God's plan to make all things new to redeem all things, that God is actually working through his body to redeem the earth, to redeem his good creation, and that includes the works of our hands. So we should be thinking Christianly about what it means to be a pharmacist, a stay-at-home dad, a soccer coach, a music producer, whatever sphere you find yourself in. You and I are great fans of the seven mountains way of thinking about culture, but whatever realm or or mountain, or sphere that you find yourself in, discipleship is important because it's not just about you going to heaven one day. We follow Jesus so that we can join him in redeeming and reclaiming all things. One of, one of my life verses is Revelation eleven fifteen, And I believe that all human divine history is heading to one, toward that moment where the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So what it actually means to follow Jesus today as a disciple is to live into that certain eschatological moment where he will reign and rule as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a pharmacist, as a farmer, whatever sphere you find yourself in, you're living into that moment. And I think if we actually had that view of the story, instead of the dualistic view that we just pray a prayer to go to heaven one day as a form of fire insurance, if we had that more holistic view, then discipleship actually makes sense. Then we, we, we're we invited into this, this journey of not only thinking Christianly, but behaving Christianly as an act of worship to transform everything. When I hear you say that, I'm reminded of something I came across several years ago, and I, I'm grateful for Hugh Welchel. And he reminds us that the Hebrew root for work and worship is the same word. It's mm, good. And we have lost this sense, what you're talking about. And I love how you put in front of discipleship, you put the, we have lost this sense of restoring all things. And therefore, discipleship loses its sense of importance other than being, well, I get discipled because it helps me grow in Christ and, you know, I'm a better father and so on, which all things, those things are good. But the phrase thinking Christianly and restoring all things We have a major obstacle to your point. I experienced this when I worked in the world of politics and was challenged by friends that I was wasting my time, that I was working against the will of God. How do we turn this around or do we focus mostly on younger people coming into Christianity and equip them from the get go with a proper biblical view of Christ, culture, discipleship, work, worship and so on? Yeah. Well, in the CCO, we have something called a Jubilee vision, and it's this transforming vision of joining God to make all things new. And that's what we are. We are discipling students into a worldview. Creation, God created the world as good, yet it has been damaged by evil, and so it's fallen. But Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has redeemed us, and he will restore all things in what I call the apocalypse. And so, you know, I, I think that that frame coming to the durable tension and the problems that we encounter in the world, in our own selves, in our own hearts, in our communities, in the world, if we can come with a biblical narrative, a worldview that calls us higher and that encapsulates all things, 
right? Someone has even said the pots and pans matter to God, right? So the, the violins and nanotechnology and artificial mm-hmm. intelligence and, you know, uh, farming implements, uh, every single thing in the earth matters and it all belongs to God. Now, if we really believe that, what difference would that make in the kinds of things that we put our hands to? Well, we believe that it would make all the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. And I think whether or not a student at the age of 18 or 19 or 20 can grasp fully what that invitation means for the rest of their lives, you know, I, I do think that we we are being converted. We have a conversion moment where our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're on our way to heaven. We have a personal relationship with Jesus, but we're also being converted into this greater kingdom story. And the invitation of Christ to us is to join him every step of the way as he leads and guides us. You know, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I, I've used this uh, this phrase, a Jubilee vision. We have a conference called the Jubilee Conference that happens every February in, in Pittsburgh because, Guy, everybody in America wants to go to glorious Pittsburgh in the month of February. I've been told <laughs> It's a fantastic time. Yeah, I've, it, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> we have it at the convention center, and it's electric, right? And we have you know several thousand people come, and most of them are college students, but we have a large number of people who are working professionals because they have bought into this jubilee vision of joining God in their workplace to join Him in making all things new. So we will partner in a with uh, a person who's on their pathway in their studies towards accounting. We'll partner somebody in dentistry with dental students. And so it's a beautiful picture of not just discipling students so that they can pray the right way and read their Bibles the right way and evangelize the right way, but so that they can actually go into all of life with this transforming vision. Mm -hmm. That's that's powerful. That's powerful. And it, it reflects my journey working in the world of politics, but also heading organizations that were involved in being transformative in the culture, like when I was president at Pinnacle Forum. Now I'm a a certified professional leadership coach. So I get to work one-on-one with individuals and the age range is from their 20s to their 60s. And it's all about that same message. You have a call as every believer does to be a servant leader. And wherever God has placed you to serve and serve effectively and grow in that leadership calling. Uh, One of my clients is 27 years old and in his peer sphere, he's not very optimistic of what he sees. He sees a lot of meaninglessness. He sees a lot of just go along to get along. He doesn't see what you're seeing. So what could I say to him to get him to look beyond his immediate peer group right now. Yeah, well, he's not alone, is he? I think that we have a teleological crisis in the world, a crisis of meaning. We see our work, our money, our political power, our social status, our prestige as simply tools to advance us to whatever our objectives are. Mm-hmm. You know, So I would say the first thing that I would say to him is that w- we need to first start with this conviction that all things belong to Jesus. Some people call this spear sovereignty, that there isn't a single inch, there's every single square inch of -hmm. God's good earth belongs to him, including us and the work of our hands. Mm -hmm. So when when we believe that, then everything matters, right? The other thing that I would say, however, is that there's a little bit of a, not a little bit, there is a conspiracy that Jesus invites us into, that we are co-conspirators with a a kingdom that is disruptive, that's upside down from the way in which the world works. Our Savior isn't a political figure. Our our Savior isn't the financial assets that we have in our bank accounts and our brokerage accounts. Our Savior is Jesus Christ. And Jesus questioned the very fiber and fabric of everything that that society is comprised of. He he turned it on its head, so to speak. So if you if you really want to get into the heart and mind of Jesus, you read the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are probably the most controversial teachings of Jesus, where he puts all of our thinking upside down on its mm-hmm. head. In fact, it's so radical. I, I've met uh, Muslims who have uh, read it without any Christian influence, without any Christian witness, without any church. Simply reading the Beatitudes led them to Jesus Christ. Because it it answered all of the inadequacies of Islam, it answered all of the injustices that they've seen in in their world. 
So I would say that we start with this bigger story, this gospel of the kingdom, and then we also recognize that Jesus invites us into that. It's not just a story that we're reading that's playing itself out out there. So to your young mentee, I would say that Jesus is inviting him into something so much bigger than just his leadership role. Or, you know, Mm -hmm. you could say this to anybody. I was sitting down with some donors recently and they were over at the farm and they have a a very successful business and it's a good business and they they use the funds from their business to fund missions. And then they turned to me and they said, you know, we really hate, we hate what we do. And Hmm. I've heard this from a lot of, a lot of people who've grown very, very large, successful businesses. It's just a means to an end. We're right. just, uh, you know, running this business because it puts food on the table and we get to give to church. And well, what a terrible, terrible a tragedy to have something beautiful that you've built become, um, you know, an albatross around your neck. Right. And so we began to talk about how their work, the actual work of their hands mattered. I was with another uh, fellow who owns a, uh, a couple of chemical companies down in Ohio. And he, when he began to realize uh, this Jubilee vision, this greater story, this kingdom story, he said, York, the day that I began to realize that God cared about the pigments in the paints that I was making, that he cared at the molecular level about the science and not just the product that I was going to bring to market, it changed everything. And now he's gone on, and I've heard, I've heard this from a couple of uh, different donors who are in the CCO's world. He's gone on and he's bought out all his competitors. You know, he's dominated the market because he's so passionate about the actual work of his hands and making a product that actually has meaning and purpose in God's good world. Hmm. So I would say that that that's a uh, you know just like what we say to the young student, an eighteen year old student, a person who's running a business, your leader that you're mentoring, we invite them into a bigger story. Mm-hmm. We put them into the story and then invite them to follow Jesus in the way in which he has gifted them and blessed them. So something else that I have run into, I've encountered among Christians that I have known, some of them for many years, many who were very active in cultural transformational work, uh, mostly politics, because that was where I spent a lot of my years, but not not confined to that. But what I've encountered in the last several years among many of them is a growing feeling of discouragement, even despair. They see where the culture is going and how rapidly it is descending into chaos and, frankly, just insanity when we look at some of the things that we see happening out there. And they throw up their hands and go, I guess people who have said it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse, can't do anything about it, and Jesus is going to come back, I guess they're right, so why should I even try? Hmm. What would you say to them? Yeah, well, what you're describing is really, uh, it's a, it's endemic in the culture. I, I've mentioned this teleological crisis. We're doing a lot of work in the D.C. DMV area. The CCO is growing. For most of our 50 years, we've been in the uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, all throughout Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, but God's opening doors for us to grow uh, in California and Florida and all throughout the country. And uh, the DMV DC market is one that we're particularly passionate about because this Jubilee vision, when it comes to a person who is experiencing this teleological crisis, it can transform them. It's almost as if they experience a second conversion. Okay. So I was just uh, at uh, Mark Batterson's uh, church there right on Capitol Hill with um, a bunch of other leaders. I'm on the board for the National Association of Evangelicals. And what Mark Batterson has uh, has done there is just a beautiful expression of community transformation, uh, empowering young staffers in the political realm, people who own businesses, uh, big and small. He has created a space where people can think Christianly about politics, about law, about commerce, all in a beautiful facility that really is a God story, if you ever have him on. Uh, It's a beautiful story about how they acquired their property. But a transformative vision of joining Christ in the political realm. Here's here's the difference between Christendom and really what we're talking about thinking Christianly. Christendom is about using the power of God to overlay on society our wishes, even if they're godly wishes. It's about conquering culture, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking Christianly is recognizing this sphere. So let's just take this political sphere as an example. This sphere already belongs to Jesus Christ. And one day he will take up his reign and he will begin to rule. 
So how do we actually think about the political sphere as a vassal, as something that already belongs to God and that can be used for his kingdom vision, right? So, so too many times Christians think about whether it's commerce or law or academia or the mountains that you and I talk about, that we think about those as simply tools to achieve an end. No, they're durable spheres. God created spheres that mm-hmm. actually can bring and ought to bring Jesus glory and advance his mission. So I think the teleological crisis that many people, the fellow that you're talking about, the teleological crisis really is a, it's a symptom of an underlying lack of a bigger story. Mm -hmm. When we actually become convicted that there's a bigger story, that Jesus is at the center of the story, that history is moving in a certain direction, that it isn't all about you, right? It's It's about Jesus. I think that's the beginning of turning the tide in this teleological crisis. Okay. All right. Well, as we bring this to a close, York, and this is powerful, and I I'm really going to encourage not only the listeners who are listening to this, but to share this with others, because this is a, I like how you put it, this is a second conversion approach Mm -hmm. to biblical Christianity for, for many Christians. I was so fortunate in having a discipler who understood this, who exposed me to everything from Francis Schaeffer to comparative theology to things about government and politics. Mm-hmm. And that changed the trajectory of my life. So I am very passionate about what you're talking about, what you're doing. And again, would encourage listeners to check out your website, ccojubilee.org, right? Was it org? That's right. Yep. So ccojubilee.org. You've got your major conference in February and the, the world's vacation hotspot in February, <laughs> Pittsburgh. You got it, guy. <laughs> and um, to begin to look at this differently. Hmm. And I think the last thing I want to say before then any final thoughts from you is what you just said a moment ago about the distinction between conquering the spheres of culture and recognizing they already are under the sovereignty of Christ. So our role is to be influencers in that culture to help bring about what is the, that final return of, of Christ. That's a different way to look at it, even for many of us who have been in that world as change agents. Yeah. yeah. So that was very helpful. So what would be final thoughts you would share with our listeners? Yeah, well, we've uh, talked at a very high level, a very philosophic level about Gen Z and stats and sphere sovereignty and all of those kinds of things. But I have the heart of an evangelist because I am an evangelist. And for many people walking in darkness, these ideas are are beyond them. And uh, they can't even see their hand in front of their face. The darkness is so, so thick. And that's why I'm so thankful that our salvation isn't based on wisdom, on superiority of speech. It's based on the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is God's power for salvation. He died on the cross for our sin. He invites us to receive that forgiveness that is just and accessible because of his death on the cross. And he rose again on the third day. And because he's alive, we can know him personally. The good news of the gospel is good regardless of where you're starting. As an atheist, you know, I grew up homeless on the streets of Detroit. We had a sign in the front of our house that said the Moors, the atheists. We had a barrel for burning Bibles and other religious religious propaganda. I was very, very far from God. But there are people right inside the church that are, are just as lost as I was when I was walking in darkness as an atheist. And the great news, Guy, is that God loves us, and He so loves us that He gave us Jesus. Right. And so even though all of the things that we're talking about are true and transformative and, and can lead to the second conversion kind of experience that I so desperately want many, many Christians in America to have, the reality is that, that many people need to start with just the very basic message. Listen, God loves you. God does love you. And he loves you so much. He sent Jesus. Mm-hmm. So let's make the main thing the main thing. And very pertinent message as far as reminder, given we just celebrated the incarnation of Christ and what all that means. So mm-hmm. so thank you, York, for joining us today, for sharing your wisdom. Your passion obviously comes forth very clearly. And I, I so relate to you and having grown up, our household wasn't 
actively atheist, but it was for all practical purposes, atheist. And so coming out of that background and coming to Christ, and I just celebrated 50th anniversary of coming to Christ. Hmm, that, that was, I, I am thankful every day for how he rescued me from the darkness because yeah. I was on a path of darkness. Why he did, that's in his, <laughs> in his will and understanding, but he did. And you can share the same thing. And so we have a passion for those, especially those young people who they're on that same path to darkness, but they're searching, they're looking. They just don't know what they're looking for. Amen. They just don't know what they're looking for. So, so as a certified professional leadership coach, I have the privilege of working with leaders of all ages and backgrounds, C-level executives, nonprofit leaders, small business owners, self-employed professionals. I'm passionately driven to help each of these men and women be better servant leaders every day. And in this podcast, my goal is to help you do the same. That's my calling. That's my mission. If this message today speaks to you, please subscribe to this podcast by searching Flourishing Leadership with Guy Rogers on your favorite podcast app, or you can find it on youtube.com, the slash, the at symbol, Flourishing Leadership, youtube.com slash at Flourishing Leadership. You can subscribe to it there. And please let your friends and colleagues know about it. Check us out at flourishing-leadership.com, where you can learn more about my leadership coaching approach and methodology and how it can help you and also where you can find all of the podcast episodes. Because today, your leadership, flourishing leadership, has never been more needed.